Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Plus podcast. Very exciting episode today. I'm going to be plugging this like mad. This is a fantastic conversation. It clarifies so many things that have been buzzing around in the uh, discussions around the transition uh, away from fossil fuels uh, for the last 12 years, to my knowledge. But actually, no, I'm not even going to get, define the time. For the last 60 years. This has been a critically important uh, point of discussion. Uh, today's guest is amazing. It's a really fascinating episode. Please do really push and tell all your friends about it and send it to people and send links to people and spread the word because this is a really exciting time. Just before we dive in, going to do a really quick mention because I actually spent time uh, with Jordan the other day. Jordan is one of the founders of My Energy. Uh, she came over to the United States when we did our show in San Diego, which was a huge success. I'm really pleased to announce it was great fun. We then went up to Vancouver where we looked at the venue for next year's Vancouver Fully Charged Live Show. Amazing! Uh, very exciting about that. But uh, just to go back to Jordan and My Energy. Their stuff is so brilliant. They've been sponsoring this podcast for a long time. That's coming to an end shortly, but that's very, very much. Uh, we're hugely grateful for them for supporting us in our struggles. Um, please go to myenergy.com, M Y E N E R G I dot com to see what they are doing because they are about, well, basically, she told me what they're about to be launching, and I can't tell you yet, but I will tell you as soon as we know. But it is very exciting, and it is. Uh, what's great is it's a it's a new uh, piece of electronics that a lot of people will be very interested in and it's available it's available they've got lots of it i can't tell you uh, what it is yet because they haven't launched it but they're launching it very shortly and it will make a difference in the world and what they are doing is making a difference in the world so uh, my energy make the zappy charger and the eddy um uh, you may have heard my chair things i just shifted because i get excited when i talk about Zappy charges. Zappy charges. It's a really simple charge. You stick it on your wall and you plug it in. And if you're if you've got solar panels, you can take just the solar panel solar power that would have gone into the grid and you put it in your car. It's as simple as that. I reckon I've done about twelve thousand miles of charging, so twelve thousand miles worth of electricity just from solar just this year that I put into our electric cars. Um, what does that mean? That means that when people are talking about the massive increase in prices for, for charging electric cars, don't apply to that 12,000 miles. They do apply when I use a rapid charger, which I will be doing this week. But, you know, the fact is we can mitigate against a lot of it uh, if we're lucky enough to have uh, access to that technology. And absolutely, I agree. And all I hear from all day is people who aren't lucky enough to do that. And I absolutely empathize with that. And we have to find ways of making the energy transition equitable and the ownership models less corrosive and we have to change the way we live and that's more important than almost anything else <clears throat> anyway so my energy are doing their bit to transform the way that we produce and consume energy and it's really highly commendable do go along to myenergy.com and have a look and that's it i'm not going to talk about them anymore today because we're moving on now we're going to talk about hydrogen Oh, yes, we're talking about hydrogen. And uh, to do that, I'm, I've approached the Hydrogen Science Coalition, which is a fascinating group of engineers and scientists and independent academics who are working to bring an evidence-based viewpoint to the heart of the hydrogen discussion. Well, that's very refreshing. So I was lucky enough to talk to David Seabon, who is Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Cambridge in England. Some of you around the world may have heard of Cambridge. Apparently, it's quite a good university. He is, a, uh, as I said, a professor of me uh, mechanical engineering uh, and a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. And he is the director of the Centre for Sustainable Road Freight and leads the uh, Cambridge University Engineering Department's Transport Research Group. So he's, he's kind of right in the mix. He knows this is the critically important thing. He knows what he's talking about. He has authored or co-authored more than 150 peer-reviewed papers on the dynamic safety envir and environmental performance of heavy goods vehicles. 
So he kind of gets it. He's not making stuff up. He's not talking from an emotional or political standpoint. He's talking from a very clear, well-researched, scientific trans, uh, standpoint. Uh, it's just amazing conversation. And the, if you go to their website, h2sciencecoalition.com, it is really worth having a look at their principles, their five principles, um, guiding principles on hydrogen's role in the energy transition. They are, we, we talk about them in the show, I'm not going to talk about them now. We talk about them in this episode, but they are so clear. They clarify all the kind of ang the worries and anxieties I've had around hydrogen. Uh, and, and, you know, the positive sides, it's not, it's not all negative, but that we have to face it. There's quite a lot of negative stuff about hydrogen in this episode. But uh, negative stuff based on fact, not based on supposition or opinion. And I think that is critically important. So that's enough from me. Do tell your friends about this episode because I think you're going to love it. But please welcome to the Fully Charged Plus podcast, David Seabon. So, David, uh, well, for start, thank you for finding time to, to talk to us uh, on the show. Um, uh, it, it, I'll just quickly say that one of the most common tweets and comments I've had uh, in the last 12 years since I've been making this show is, uh, you know, uh, your battery cars are all, all well and good and fancy is a stopgap measure, but obviously the future is hydrogen. And, uh, you know, it is amazing how often that happens. Now, I'm going to modify that slightly because it's definitely faded. That Those comments have faded out a bit in the last couple of years, but they were so common. They were, I'm afraid, always from men. <laughs> I, never had a, I never had that comment from a woman. <laughs> uh, and uh, I didn't, you know, I've always been very open-minded. I've going, you know, my basic principle is if I'm cycling along a road in a city and a hydrogen fuel cell car overtakes me, I'm very happy because what's coming out of it is some water and uh, or an electric car. But I'm very unhappy when a diesel car overtakes me because then I've got to breathe in the fumes. So from that level, it's brilliant. I'm all for it. I've driven all three of the currently or the one-time commercially available electric uh, hydrogen fuel cell cars. They were all great. There was nowhere to refuel them. <laughs> they were incredibly expensive. <laughs> but as cars, they were fantastic. They worked very well. But so can we kind of go back to the one, I think one start out place to, to, to dive into this is the colours of hydrogen, because that throws people. So hydrogen, is, it feels like in the last sort of three or four years has developed a colour scheme. And I get very confused about yeah. you go through the colours of hydrogen. Well, thanks, Robert. Yeah, there are so many, as you say, these different colours of hydrogen. Broadly, there's two, there's two ways to make hydrogen. You can... Right electrolyze water that means you put a current through pure water and hydrogen comes out one side and oxygen comes out the other side uh, that takes a lot of energy because you have to pull apart the h2o the water is h2o right it's two hydrogens yeah. and one oxygen atom in each molecule you have to pull that apart the hydrogen goes out one side the oxygen goes out the other so that 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 uh, takes a lot of energy um, and that if, if the electricity is uh, renewable, then that is called green hydrogen, right? right. But, the, but the electricity has to come from wind turbine or solar panel or something like that. Um, interestingly, if it's not renewable electricity, it has a different color, and then it's called yellow hydrogen. So if you use the electricity right. that just comes out of the electricity grid out of the socket in the wall, which is a mix, right? Right. It's a mix of some gas power and some coal fire and some nuclear and all that. And if you, and some off wind. So if you use that electricity to make hydrogen, then it's called yellow. Not people, people often yellow. don't okay. use the yellow hydrogen word, but it's important yeah. in, in my view, because, um, you know, if you, if you uh, plug an electrolyzer in, that's what you're going to get. And so that the right. the the carbon emissions are the carbon emissions of using grid electricity rather than no. completely clean green hydrogen. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, that if you build a new wind turbine for the purpose of making hydrogen, then it's not being used for decarbonising the electricity grid. It, 
is not being used for decarbonising industry or for running electric vehicles or for running homes and whatever. So there's a kind of an opportunity cost and uh, yeah. and that's important. So that's green and yellow in parenthesis, in, 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 yeah. uh, in parenthesis, hydrogen. Um, the other main type of hydrogen comes from uh, from from fossil fuel, and right. uh, particularly from gas. And what you do is, if you take uh, natural gas and you treat it with very hot steam, then hydrogen comes out of that, and carbon dioxide right. comes out. So what you're doing is, you, the natural gas is methane, which is uh, uh, its chemical s chemical name is uh, its chemical symbol is CH four, which means it's got one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms in a molecule of methane. So when you treat it with hot steam, the hydrogen goes off one way, and the carbon gets bonded to oxygen and goes off as carbon dioxide. Uh, now right. normally that carbon dioxide just goes into the atmosphere. When you when you make methane, sorry, when you make uh, hydrogen, we make a lot of hydrogen yeah. uh, in the world. Two percent of the world's uh, carbon emissions comes from making hydrogen, mostly right from from grey from this sort of hydrogen, uh, where yeah. where the where the emissions just go into the atmosphere. It's called grey hydrogen, uh, and right. mostly it's used for making fertilizer. Uh, turn it into ammonia to make fertilizer and also for treating um, uh, oil products, petrochemical, and the petrochemical industry uses it a lot. Right. So that's called grey um, hydrogen. Uh, and right. as I say, it's 2% of the world's carbon emissions. So there's, you know, and that's about the same as aviation, right? So making hydrogen currently generates wow. about the same emissions as making aviation. As, 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 fly, as all flights, all flights. You know, I mean, that's right. Wow, that is. <laughs> so that's a lot. That's right. It's Puts mainly, it as I say, used for fertilizer, which of course is essential. Right. We can't. Yes. Where, where we might deal without do without some aviation, we can't do without fertilizer because we've got yeah. however many billion people on the planet that have to be fed. So yeah. So now, if you make that hydrogen, if you capture the carbon dioxide that comes out of that hydrogen making process, now you capture it and store it. Um, in a bury it under the ground somewhere in a yeah uh, some sort of a geological storage. Then it becomes called yeah. blue hydrogen, and blue hydrogen right. is very attractive uh, for the for the fossil fuel industry. Uh, yeah, and the, so one of the things that's very interesting is that when you take that methane, the CH four, the natural gas, when you yeah. strip the carbon off it. It's actually the carbon that carries most of the energy. It's not the hydrogen that carries the energy in. So it's 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 oxidizing the carbon is most of the energy. So when you strip the carbon off, you end up with a much right. lower energy fuel. The the hydrogen right. is much lower energy because yeah. you've taken all the goodness out of it and you've put it down a hole in the ground. <laughs> so so what that means is that you need a lot more if you want to deliver the same amount of energy at the end, right. you need a lot more methane if you're going to deliver it by hydrogen. Uh, and it's right. something like 40% right. more. So you wow. need to buy a lot more natural gas if you want to fuel your economy with hydrogen than if you just yeah. fuel it with natural gas. Yes. So when I say it's attractive to the fossil fuel industry, it means that it's instead of... Obvious. Yeah. Instead of, well, see, the, the fossil fuel industry's got a problem, right? Because we're no longer going to be powering cars with fossil fuels, with petrol, yeah. and, and we're no longer going to be heating our homes with gas. All that's, we think, going to go electric. And so the fossil fuel industry's got no market. But now, of course, if yeah. you can have hydrogen and you sell 40% more gas, that is like a that's a, a real blessing for a fossil fuel Boom industry time. that, yeah. that is, uh, has got problems on the horizon. So it's very, very attractive yeah. for the fossil fuel industry. So when you hear people talk about hydrogen, unfortunately, you have to say, well, this is the fossil fuel industry talking, because it is. Uh, the yes. fossil fuel industry yeah. is lobbying very hard for hydrogen. Yeah. And they lobby for green hydrogen. They lobby for, they really want blue hydrogen. Uh, 
Green yeah. hydrogen is a little bit of a smoke screen, screen, smoke screen in my view, because it requires so much energy that um, yeah, it's not really practical. But I mean, it's worth. Can we just quickly go because those figures, I, I I can't remember the exact figures, but the amount of, if we just do it in kilowatt hour terms, the amount of kilowatt hours you put into that water and the amount of kilowatt hours you get out as hydrogen is, it's not that. It doesn't look that good. <laughs> Well, so, it look so that efficient. well, it, it's not. The electrolysis process itself is about seventy-five percent efficient. Okay, so that means that you get seventy-five percent of the energy out the end that you started with. But there is oh, a right. big, oh, that sounds better than I've heard. So it, that's it does. That's, but the energy has changed yeah. form, and it's really important. Right, this is really important, yeah. and it's something that people don't really understand. Unfortunately, there's two types of energy. A kilowatt hour is not a kilowatt hour. There's energy right. which we call work, and there's energy that we call heat. They have to all add up. The first law of thermodynamics says it all has to add up, but heat is not nearly as good as work. So electricity is work. So you can right. take you can take uh, electricity and you can put it into an electric motor and convert it to actual actual um, movement work done yeah. movement at about you know ninety or ninety five percent efficiency. Very very good. Very good. Right. But heat is a different story. So diesel fuel is considered to be heat. Petrol right. is considered to be heat. Chemical fuels are heat. Hydrogen yeah. is heat. Now, you right. know, Robert, just as well as I do, that when you put petrol into a car, the efficiency of the engine is about 30%. Right? Yeah. So cars are not very efficient, and you hear this all the time. You know, car and diesel... Yeah. A really good diesel, 40%, maybe 45% for a huge marine diesel. But you can never get more than 50% efficiency out of it because of the second law of thermodynamics. Unfortunately, we have to use these terms, which just says that there's yeah. a limit on what you can... When you convert heat back to work again, there's a limit, and it's set by yeah. the second law of thermodynamics. So the thing about converting electricity into hydrogen is yes, you lose 25% of the energy in the electrolysis process, but critically, you convert it into heat. And when you do that, you have to convert that heat back into electricity again to use it. You do that right. through a fuel cell, and that is at yeah. best 50% efficient. The same as a diesel engine is at best 50% efficient. A fuel cell. Wow. Is it? Okay. Now, so then if you take 75%, and you multiply right. it by 50 percent now you're at 35 percent yeah. you've got inefficiencies due to transportation compression uh yeah. and uh all of those things and when you go through all of that the round trip from electricity to hydrogen and back to electricity again which is what you have to do if you want to run in a yeah. fuel cell vehicle that is at best about 30 percent efficient You've lost seventy percent right. of the energy in doing that. that so it's not in. that the electrolysis yeah. process itself is inefficient; it's that by doing the electrolysis, you end up with something which is not nearly as useful, and it's very inefficient to convert that into the useful thing you need, which is electricity again. Yeah. For work. That's so, a, I mean, that's a yeah, that's a that's fairly a devastating analysis. <laughs> Well, I just want to now go back to your five uh, guiding principles, which really helped clarify my thoughts on on hydrogen and its uses. Because I mean, I've you know I've always it, it, it has such a long history. I'm 66 years old. I remember being, I think, 60. Uh, sorry, being six, six <laughs> years old, going to the <laughs> cinema to see a film with my dad called 55 Days of Peking. Now. <laughs> I don't remember anything about the film very much, but, and I should look it up to see when it was, but I was probably between six and eight years old. And there was a Pathé news report, black and white, at the cinema, talking about hydrogen being the future. Well, that is, it is close to 60 years ago. That's the, the key point that, that was being discussed and talked about as a, as a future fuel. So it is, it's not new, is it? When I mean, we've been, this has been toyed with for a long time, and it particularly came from the nuclear industry in the sixties and seventies, right? With this sort of prospect of infinite amount of electricity, in, free sort electricity, of infinite free electricity, right? Yeah. Which was what nuclear was promising in those days. Yeah. We've seen that that isn't, unfortunately, not 
quite uh, the case. Not quite <coughs> the case. Uh, but every time there's a prospect of free electricity, people can say, well, look, the, the, the efficiency problems, are, uh, you know, you, you engineers, you keep talking about efficiency, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we've, just, we've just talked about efficiency. The, if you've got free electricity, you know, you've got the prospect matter. of nuclear yeah. fusion, you know, or, yeah. or, or whatever, then, yeah, you waste as much energy as you like. But we don't yeah. have that situation now. Yeah. You know, we have a situation where if you want another kilowatt hour of electricity, you have to have another kilowatt hour of, of offshore wind Generated. turbine or, yeah. or solar panel or nuclear power or whatever it is. And that means that if you waste electricity, if you waste energy, you have to build a lot more of that yeah. renewable capacity, right? So um, in... Uh, you know, the hydrogen process is a very inefficient. It means that you need three, four, five times more renewable electricity if you're going to do green hydrogen yeah. than if you just electrify in the first place. And that yeah. three, four, five times, depending on what you're doing, three, four, five times more ele renewable electricity means three, four, five times more offshore wind turbines, yeah. more maintenance, more capital cost, more, you know, yeah. all, all the costs. And it means that it costs three or four, five times more per kilowatt hour. Right. Because you waste, somebody has to pay for the waste energy. You know, if you're yes. wasting that seventy percent of energy, we still have to make the energy. We still have to pay yes. for the energy. Somebody's got to pay for it. And if yeah. the end user is paying for it, they're only getting thirty percent of what was generated. They have to pay for that other that, that you know, seventy percent that was wasted, yeah. and that's why it's much more expensive. Yeah. But then the other one, the other story that, that sort of appears and disappears every now and then, and I, there was, I've recently been party to a row between uh, a big plumbing company and, and someone I know about hydrogen, hydrogen ready boilers with right. the notion that in the future we'll be running hydrogen through the gas mains yeah. and running our boilers off it and we won't have any CO2 because it's hydrogen, it's all clean and blah, blah, blah. Uh, which I, you know, as, a, as someone outside that industry or outside science, you go, well, that sounds reasonable, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> until you start to think about it a bit. It but what, I'm one of the key problems I, that I understand, apart, uh, totally apart from the energy uh, uh, side of it, is the, is the way hydrogen, how hard it is to store hydrogen and to seal hydrogen, to hold it in something like we're used to with methane. That's perfectly, you know, we've got that technology pretty sussed. I'm sure there are leaks, but they're not catastrophic. But, you know, all the people, all the engineers I've talked to say it's really hard to stop <coughs> hydrogen leaking and it affects metals as well. So. Indeed, indeed. So that the hydrogen molecules are the smallest. They're, you know, very, very small right. molecules and they get through everything. They do uh, still uh, gets what's called hydrogen embrittlement. It becomes very brittle yeah. as a result of hydrogen uh, getting into the cracks and little cracks and stuff. So... Right. It, uh, you can't use ordinary steel. Most cast iron and steel pipes can't be used, so they have to be replaced. Right. So you start off with the position that you're going to use this infrastructure, but of course you can't use the infrastructure. You've got to replace it because otherwise right. the pipes are going to crack and burst and get hydrogen explosions periodically around the place. Right. So that's not great. Um, right. So that's uh, that is the first uh, that is the first problem. It it uh, is colourless and odourless and uh, uh, you can't see it burning. Uh, it's highly explosive. It's much higher, f much more f explosive than gas. Uh, it generates higher NOx emissions. So the, we've got these problems of nitrous oxides generated when you burn gas in the home, in the boiler, or in the, right. on a gas cooker. Much, much worse, higher flame temperature, much, much worse NOx emissions from burning hydrogen. Wow. So, so it's got worse NOx emissions than methane. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the problems wow. of asthma and air, air quality in the home is much worse. It's explosive. Right. Um, so, and you have to replace all the infrastructure. So it seems like yeah. a great idea, and, the, and, and, and it's being pushed, of course, being pushed by the incumbent gas industry, as you would, yeah. right? If your business was under threat, you would do that. Yeah. That's, of course, what you'd do. Yeah. But it doesn't make sense for um, the population. <clears throat> and in particular... The particular problem is first of all, first of all, you got, you got to get it to homes, and that that is uh, is as I've said, is, is not a problem. Then you've got to make the hydrogen, and that that uh, is very wasteful, as we've said. Yeah. 
And the, the big thing about heating is that the alternative of so-called a heat pump is a miracle of engineering. A heat pump is just like the same thing as an air conditioner in reverse. Uh, it's very much yeah. like your fridge. Um, you take heat out of a warm place, out of the butter in your fridge, and the heat comes out the back. You know, if you you fill yeah. the um, the back of your the fridge, the back of the fridge that, is always that's, warm. That's, yeah. It's warm, and that's because is, is the electricity is pumping heat out of the inside of the fridge, and it comes out the outside. If you just yeah. turn that around so that the outside is in your house, uh, yeah. then it's a heat pump, and uh, and the the inside of the fridge is outside. <laughs> the house is a bit confusing. Right. Yes. Yeah. So the thing about a heat pump is that it's um, it it can pump about <clears throat> three or four times more heat than the energy it uses. So if you put in one kilowatt one kilowatt into a heat pump, you get three or four kilowatts of heat into your house. Right. Now that's fabulous, right? But so here's the thing, you're putting in one kilowatt of work of that electricity, which is work as we said, which is the good stuff. Yeah. And you're getting three kilowatt hours, three kilowatts of heat, which is not the good stuff. But right. every kilowatt of electricity can give you three kilowatts of heat, which is yeah. Which is uh, which is why it's the heat pump so brilliant. So, if you compare that heat pump with hydrogen, so you if you take you could take your 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 um, renewable electricity. If you go yeah. via a heat pump route, you transfer that renewable electricity. You have small losses in the electricity grid. You put in the heat yeah. pump, and you generate three times what you started with. So that's yeah. brilliant. If you go the hydrogen route, you take your electricity, your electrolyzed water, that's 75% efficient. You compress it, you transport it, which is very inefficient with hydrogen. Hydrogen is very difficult. And then you put it in a condensing boiler. Uh, and by the time you get to all of that, you've got about uh, the amount of heat that, you come, that comes out is about half of the amount of electricity. So if you started right. with 100 kilowatt hours of renewable electricity, the heat pump gives you 300. <laughs> the hydrogen route gives you 50. It gives you 50. Wow. Okay, so now we've got 300, every, you know, 100 yeah. kilowatts of electricity gives you 300 kilowatts of heat by yeah. route A or 50 by route B. It's a factor of yeah. six in between. You get six times more heat per kilowatt hour of renewable electricity with a heat pump right. than with a hydrogen yeah. boiler. Turn it around the other way. It means you need six times more offshore wind turbines if you want to heat the country's homes with green hydrogen, with hydrogen. Yeah. than if you just use the electricity in a heat pump. Yeah. So a factor of six. So that's a right. huge factor. That means six times more offshore wind. And actually, you know, I've done calculations for the UK. It's really not possible for the UK to have that amount yeah. of offshore wind. It's really not. It, it would require 10 times increase in the amount of electricity that we have now right. by, uh, and provided by renewables. I mean, yeah. it's at a scale, it's a magnitude that nobody has discussed really because contemplated, the, yeah. the industry knows that it's not practical. It's just yeah. completely impractical. So, again, what the industry says, well, we'll use green hydrogen, it's nice and clean. Yeah. Actually, what they're doing is they're pushing blue hydrogen, which is the opportunity to sell more yeah. natural gas. So, and then, I mean, the, the critical thing about blue hydrogen, because it all sounds very good, is is so I, I, I'm still trying to get my head around CCS because I uh, have did a, a we did an episode about carbon capture and storage at Imperial College where they have a experimental carbon capture yeah. machine or system. I would say in uh, 2012. <clears throat> you know, so that was then, and they were talking about this will be rolled out in the next five years, and that you'll see this everywhere. And I, I you know, and you go because I'm, I'm sort of green in the sense of I don't know anything. So I, I go, oh, that's good. That's better than just letting it go. So oh, good carbon capture that removes a problem. Well, it hasn't ever worked. I well, has it worked? Can it? it can it work? I'm sure, it technically, scientifically, can work. But the storage bit, even if you can capture it economically effectively the storage bit just i just go hang on a minute you know what if you could turn it into rock 
I thought, think that's a clever system. If you make like building blocks out of the carbon you capture, but that doesn't seem to be what's suggested. It's, we're going to pump it <coughs> into this big hole in the ground where we've extracted a load of oil or something, and you go, well, that used to leak when it was oil <laughs> or gas. That's, right. that's right. Well, so so I think you 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 know you raise very interesting in, interesting points. I think a technology basically can work. Uh, right. But it doesn't work at scale. One of the reasons it doesn't work at scale is because it's completely unaffordable. And it, you know, just suppose you had a gray gray hydrogen production facility. You were happily making gray hydrogen, and somebody said, "We want you to put all this kit on the end of it to make and pump it up to make blue hydrogen." But we're not going to pay you any more yeah. for it, right? Right. Why would you? Why would you? Why would you do all that CCS stuff? So until there's some sort of incentive to do it, nobody's. Absolutely, nobody's going to do it. Uh, there's right. no so that now you're talking about some sort of a carbon price or you know something which is going to encourage people to do carbon capture and storage, which you know is a nice idea, but it's not yeah. happening. So and it hasn't happened for decades. People have been talking about yeah. this for decades. So that's the first problem: is that it's just too expensive. And if you if you can make the grey stuff and just vent the carbon dioxide yeah. in the atmosphere, why would you do anything else? Yeah. So, and that's part of the, you know, the, the people that are pushing hydrogen, they say, well, we'll make nice, clean blue hydrogen. What will happen yeah. is, you know, we'll install all these appliances. Where's that Where's that nice, glue, that nice blue hydrogen? Oh, we haven't quite got that working yet, but you can have this grey yeah. stuff. That will do, that'll do you for now. You can drive your truck on that. You know, drive yeah. your truck on that. Of course, if you drive a truck on grey hydrogen, it's far, far worse in carbon emissions terms than driving on diesel, right? So if you use grey hydrogen... Then driving on diesel? Wow. Then driving on diesel. Okay. If you use, use grey hydrogen, it's way worse, right? Wow. Okay. Because that's you're using what, so what I was... energy fuel. I mean, it's a disaster, yeah. a complete disaster. Yeah. So so what I was going... I was, I was going to try... I was trying to get round to, you know, because what we've done so far is 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 a pretty across-the-board, uh, you know, sort of crippling levels of criticism of the entire hydrogen economy yeah. that is so enthusiastically uh, talked about but you know uh, what what are the positive sides what are the potential realistic uses even right. if there's energy yeah. losses it makes such a difference it would be an actual benefit to yeah. the, the global population there are places where where you where you need hydrogen un undoubtedly right. So the very first right. one is fertilizer, as we mentioned, and it's yeah. you know it's one percent of the world's carbon emissions, and the and the first thing that the hydrogen industry should be doing is cleaning that up, and actually right. the government should be incentivizing that. If you there's no choice, right? Fertilizer yeah. is going to be made from ammonia. There is no choice. That industry needs to be cleaned up and made green, and that right. should be the source. That should be where the government is putting money directly into that. Let's just clean that up and do it. Let's be done with right. it. And yeah. so let's clean up the hydrogen industry first, right? Before right. we now the other the other one percent, much of it is being used in petrochemical. Uh, some of that will continue to be used for polymer making, you know, plastics. But right. a good chunk of it will go away when we stop running diesel and and uh, petrol cars. So. Right. Can, can we? Ju can you just quickly explain what what, what it, the how hydrogen is used? Are you saying that hydrogen is actually used in the refining of crude yes, oil indeed. into diesel and petrol? Indeed, yes. Oh, right, I did not know that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and there's a couple of different processes, and and a lot is used. A lot is used there, and so that hydrogen right. is typically made on site in the refinery. Uh, it's not taken anywhere. It's it's made there and then, and it's used to process the uh, the uh, petrochemical products processes right. one project for example called hydrogenation it's exactly mixing hydrogen with uh, with the with the, uh, wow. with the fuel so now so the very first thing we've we need to do is we need we need hydrogen for ammonia uh, right but the interesting thing about that is hydrogen in, in this case is being used as a chemical it's not being used as a fuel. It's rather different. It's not being used for its energy yeah. purposes. It's being used for its chemical characteristics. And in right. places where it's used for its chemical characteristics, it's absolutely needed. So that's the first one we should be looking at. Another interesting one is the steel industry. The steel In the steel right. industry, um, you have to, uh, when if you take a piece of steel and you put leave it out in the 
out in the rain, it goes rusty, right? It become it oxidizes. Yeah. And if you dig iron ore out of the west in Western Australia, you know, if you go to Australia where I come from, yeah, the whole place looks like rust because it is. Yeah. You know, there's a huge amount of iron ore, all this red dust which comes from yeah. iron ore. So the place is just rust. Now to turn rust back into iron, you have to do the opposite of oxidation, which is called reduction. And that reduction process right. uh, is typically done with coking coal. Now it can be done using, the, it can be done electrically, possibly, so-called, um, right. uh, but most likely it, it, it will be done with hydrogen. So hydrogen is being right. used as a chemical in that case and can be used to reduce iron oxide to make iron. Now, that is a big, big application because the iron industry, the steel industry, is about something like 7% of global carbon emissions. That's as right. big as the toll trucking industry. So that is a right. big, that's a big, big chunk. And just making enough hydrogen for that is a huge job. So there's plenty of yeah. business for anyone who wants to make hydrogen. There's no shortage of business right. for hydrogen, uh, cleaning up the existing hydrogen and 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 chemical processing, physics, for example, for steel, yeah. some other industrial processes. So there's no shortage of business. Uh, but when you, as soon as you start to use it as a fuel for heating or for driving trucks, it becomes it suffers from all those terrible inefficiencies that make it incredibly expensive terribly difficult right. to transport around the place uh, and and so on and it just and it just doesn't make sense so the, yeah. so the first you know we've, we've, we've set up this hydrogen science uh, coalition which is trying yeah. to bring some science to this uh, whole subject of which is really rather hyped up at the moment um, yeah. and uh, first you know we've got a bunch of principles in 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 the uh, uh, hydrogen Science Coalition. The first one is that uh, we should, th that the only near zero emission hydrogen is green hydrogen. It needs to be made by electrolysis. The blue hydrogen route that we talked about briefly is is not at all clean. Actually, right. part of it, so there's two reasons why that is. One is actually that the gas that, uh, the fossil gas, the methane, that is used uh, in blue hydrogen has uh, is very dirty, and right. and you'll have heard discussion about fugitive methane emissions. That is, emissions yeah. of methane that come from upstream processes. That comes from uh, from the well, from from venting, and from flaring. Um, you know when you flare. You burn methane; it only yeah. partially, only only partial combustion. So some of it burns, and some of it just ends in the atmosphere. So when you flare right. it, uh, and you vent it, uh, and then it leaks as well in the supply chain, yeah. and and it's pretty bad actually. The, it is pretty bad. Yeah. The 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 oil and gas industry, the total amount of fugitive methane from the oil and gas industry, is something like has emissions something like the equivalent of the total carbon footprint of Europe. <laughs> total carbon footprint, just and, and that is just leaked, vented. They just right. methane they don't want. They just couldn't be bothered. Yeah, couldn't be bothered keeping wow. clean enough, right? And it and it's so. It, I mean, it's really criminal. Where yes. does it come from? It comes, you know, the the global methane natural gas industry is pretty unregulated. It comes from yeah. Russia. It comes from. Texas, you know, from the fracking in Texas, it comes from, you know, the stands, you know, the the, the uh, Kazakhstan and the places where yeah. it comes from Qatar and from Saudi Arabia. This is where our gas comes from, and these places yeah. are not well regulated, and yeah. they just uh, the so fugitive methane is a big big problem. And then, right. as you say, the carbon capture and storage at the other end, when you make the, the blue hydrogen, that carbon capture and storage has got problems and, and, and getting high percentage capture rates is not straightforward. So you end up with blue hydrogen really being very dirty uh, right. because of these two 
two factors and very difficult to make sufficiently clean. Yeah. Uh, and particularly, it's very difficult to make it sufficiently clean on a scale where it will still be clean in 20 or 30 years' time. Right. So you build a chemical plant now, you don't build a chemical plant for five years, you know, because it's no. very expensive, so you have to run it for 30 years. Now, if that chemical plant is generating emissions, which might be acceptable now, in 30 years' time, the emissions will be far from acceptable because yeah. everything has got to be near to zero. Yeah. And, I mean, for example, if you use the government's clean hydrogen standard, which is not very clean, within a few years, uh, it will be very dirty. And so right. any plants that are built to the government's clean hydrogen standard within a few years, because the electricity grid is cleaning up as we yeah. as within a few years, that blue hydrogen, clean hydrogen standard will be dirty as hell. And right. and, and those plants that are built for 30 years, they are going to be a, a big problem, even if they're so-called clean hydrogen plants. So yeah. the government doesn't seem to have got this worked out at all, and it's, right. that's a bit of a mess. So green hydrogen is the first thing to do. The second thing is use the hydrogen to decarbonize sectors where the where it's used as a chemical, right? Yes. Ammonia and where fossil where fossil hydrogen is used today, they are the ones we should be targeting. Right. We shouldn't, under any circumstances, delay deployment of electrification uh, yeah. and and electrical solutions by by talking about it. Uh, yeah. hydrogen for heating or hydrogen for transport. It's not going to work. What right. We talked about it for heating, a factor of six difference yeah. in energy. It's a factor of three different in transport. We absolutely shouldn't delay electrification. Electrification is the one thing that we can yeah. really do to help this energy transition. Right. So they're, they're the most important three uh factors that our hydrogen science coalition has uh, concluded. There are, some, there are a couple right. of others. One is that blending hydrogen into the gas grid is uh, is complete waste uh, right. and uh, it doesn't help. At, at most, you can only get 20% hydrogen into the gas grid. Uh, the, the problem, as, as I said before, when you take the carbon out, you end up with a much lower energy fuel. Yeah, uh, and that means that when you put hydrogen into the gas grid, you're actually diluting the energy content. It's like putting water in your petrol tank. Right, it gives you something which is much lower quality. Much lower and quality is extraordinary, isn't it? That's yeah. right. And and so even if you put twenty percent hydrogen into the gas grid, it only gives you six percent reduction in carbon emissions. Right, uh, we get much better than six percent reduction in carbon emissions just by running our boilers at a at at a proper condensing temperature than, uh, you know, if we just all set our boilers properly, you get way better than 6% reduction in emissions that you get for, right. by spinning yes. up this whole hydrogen-ready boiler business. Yeah. So blending hydrogen is a complete waste of time and effort. We should be using that hydrogen to make ammonia, to be making steel for high-quality, high-merit applications and not blending yeah. it in to use it as a low-grade emissions reduction yeah and then the final I, mean, I believe there is a oh no sorry carry on yeah well it's just number five right so we've got these five principles on the hydrogen yes. science coalition <laughs> and the last one is that that uh you know you should produce hydrogen locally shipping hydrogen yeah. is really terrible it's really really hard yeah. to compress it's really hard to contain it's really hard to pump uh and it's it's uh, very difficult moving it by a ship. You know, yeah. if you liquefy it, it boils off. Um, if you compress it, you need huge quantities of it. It's really not going to be uh, transported around the world in the way that people, the way that people right. think. So you should use it locally. And that is how hydrogen is used today. All hydrogen today is made right at the point of use because it's right. so difficult to transport it. It's made right at the ammonia factory, fertilizer factory. It's made right at the petrochemical plant. 
And yep. that's because engineers over decades and decades have learned that moving hydrogen is next to impossible. Right. So to, very interesting. To, to spin yeah. up a whole hydrogen economy based on moving hydrogen around the place yeah. is not, not going to work. Yeah. No, that's pretty, because I mean, the two areas when I've uh, discussed this in the past, you know, I've always, I've kind of understood fairly early on that the concept of a hydrogen fuel cell car, private car, small passenger vehicle, is just dumb as a bag of socks. I mean, it's just stupid. It's not going to work. <laughs> and now when people talk about the materials in batteries, you know, all three of the electric cars I drove had large battery packs, for one thing. They already had I had to, because that's the way of the nature of a hydrogen fuel cell. But the hydrogen fuel cell itself contained some extremely expensive and rare metals. That's and right. then the thing that I think people, whenever I say this to people who don't really know about it, I said, have you heard about how clean the air has to be to go into a fuel cell? And you're driving along the M4 behind a diesel truck. So imagine <laughs> what you've got to take out of the air that's going in the front of that car. And I mean, right. that was, you know, the, the, the uh, regularity of having your filters replaced in a hydrogen fuel cell car is almost monthly. It is a really high expense, complicated system. You know, and it's just obvious it's not going to work. But I have sort of assumed it might be possible for things like uh, large plant machinery. I mean, I know that uh, JCB <coughs> are very keen on running hydrogen in diggers yeah. and that sort of thing, and also trucks and then possibly ships. But from what you're telling me now, that's looking less plausible. That's attractive. <laughs> well, so, so, so there's a whole bunch of things there i think the car industry i mean cars are interesting interesting right there are there are about twenty thousand hydrogen fuel cell vehicles in the world mainly in california right. there are 20 million about 20 million battery electric cars in the world yeah so it's a ratio of a thousand to one so at what point yeah. does the hydrogen car industry say okay there's a thousand times more battery electric vehicles you know yeah at what point did Betamax <laughs> admit yes. that VHS had won? And <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, were the sales a thousand to one? I don't think so. I think this, I mean, I don't remember that time that well, but I, my I recollection is, no. you know, they were pretty much neck and neck for a while. Uh, that there's, this is not, yeah. this battle is completely won. You know, there is no question of it. Right. The, the, the w w Hydrogen powered cars have lost and we're not going to see them. Yeah. I did some statistics that the filling stations in Germany, there's for, for every filling station in Germany, and there's, there's some quite large number of them, hundreds, there's nine hydrogen powered cars. Right. <laughs> Whole filling right. station, nine cars. So, anyway, that's uh, yeah. so, yeah. So, what, and, 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 and there are, there are other issues, right? You know, getting hydrogen to filling stations is non non trivial. Here's a little yeah. here, a little calculation. If you've got a, a fuel tanker carries diesel, you know, one of those big forty four ton fuel yeah. tankers says BP on the side or something. Um, if you want to carry the same amount of energy in hydrogen, yeah, right, and you carry typically carry hydrogen at seven hundred bar. That's very high pressure in a, what's called yeah. a tube trailer that have got sort of fairly thin yes. tubes, pre high pressure pressure vessel. How many, how many do you reckon you need? How many, how many tube trailers do you need, you reckon, to, to carry as much to, energy as one diesel fuel tanker? tanker? What do you I'm reckon? I'm going to say three. I'm yeah. going to say well, three. You, well, three would be a good number, but actually it would be wrong <laughs> by a factor of six. So the true number is 18. <laughs> No. So, so if you, if you want to have, if you want to terrible. fill up your filling station, right? You have one tanker a day comes to fill up the filling station. Now you've got eighteen yeah, yeah. tankers a day. Wow. So that isn't going to work. That isn't going to work. We're not yeah. going to. So all right. Well, how are we going to get our hydrogen to our filling stations? Well, maybe we could pipe it, right? Maybe we could use pipes. Yeah. Well, now we've just got to connect every filling station to the gas grid. Maybe yeah. we could electrolyze water on site and make it right on there. On site, yeah. Okay, well, that's a good idea, yeah. except that every vehicle, you need three times more electricity to do that than to just charge yeah. the batteries in the first place. So now yeah. 
you need three times the size of grid connection at every one of those points if you're going to yes. electrolyze water to make hydrogen compared to if you're going to just charge batteries. Right. So yeah. the combination of that, getting hydrogen to filling stations, completely non-trivial, uh, right. actually remarkably difficult. So the so it's just, as I say, hydrogen is made and used in the same location. It's not transported around because it's really difficult. Yeah. Now, yeah. what about trucks and diggers and so on? Well, it's true that you can run diggers on hydrogen and you can run trucks on yeah. hydrogen. Um, you have the same. And that's a, in, a, in a combustion engine, are you talking about? In a combustion well, system? Well, you've, rather got than two, fuel you've got two choices. Yes, the JCB system is a combustion system. Yeah. Um, sometimes they run a, a dual fuel, so you use diesel to com to start the combustion and you burn hydrogen right in uh, and there are conversions and retrofits and it, it looks attractive i don't see that as yeah. being a winner I, I think that if there's any hydrogen powered um transport operations it will be fuel cell operations and i think anyone who's doing combustion right. will find themselves out in the cold with technology that no one else is doing so that's yeah, my right. prediction right. that's a that's a little bit of a uh, that's a bit of a crystal ball, but the, uh, I, I think that um, that sort of combustion will be pretty rare. We'll we'll see. But anyway, yeah. that's th what JCB is yeah. going after. Um, the 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 problem is the amount of energy required and the cost of it. Right. So if yeah. you're going to do uh, a green hydrogen powered truck, which is my area is uh, trucking, uh, it's been a lot of time thinking right. about that. Um, it needs three times more electricity at source. The same reasons that we, when right. we talk about the heating, it needs about three times more. So you need th three times more renewable electricity to make green hydrogen powered truck go compared right. to making battery electric truck go. So it will cost you three times more in running costs. And actually the kit of a hydrogen powered truck is much more expensive than the kit of a battery electric truck as well. Right. So you've got a much more expensive, much higher capital cost, and you've got three times the running cost. So if I go to one of the fleet operators in my, my, my industrial partners and say, look, you can buy this hydrogen truck or this battery electric truck. Battery electric truck is going to cost you half or a third, and it's going to right. cost you one third of the amount to run. Or you can buy yeah. this hydrogen truck. Then... Clearly, on cost grounds, it's got to be the electric truck. So the question yeah. comes down to, can the electric truck do the logistics job that you need to do? That is the question. Right. The question is not which fuel should we use. It's since the electric truck is going to be so much cheaper to run, if it can do the job, then that's what people will use. Right? So the question yeah. is, can it yeah. do the job? And, and the answer is that it can. And, and we've spent a lot of time yeah. looking at electric logistics in the UK, yeah. and it can. Uh, and there's various different ways of doing it, but one way to do it is, I mean, it's all about charging, right? It's not about the vehicle at all. It's all about yeah. how you charge the vehicle. Yeah. So you need to use the opportunities you have during the day to charge the vehicle. And the opportunities yeah. you have um, in trucking are either... Um, uh, Truck drivers have to stop after four and a half hours. They have to stop for 45 minutes. Yeah. That's the law. Uh, in that 45 minutes, you can pretty much charge the battery on a fast charger. Yeah. So so the first the first point is that if as long as you have a battery that will take you four and a half hours, that will do electric logistics in the UK. The second thing, though, is that right. you can charge up on the dock when you're delivering, you know, at the warehouse. Yes. Uh, and if you fast charge at the warehouse, then that means you can get away with a much smaller battery. So we've analysed right. lots of journeys, lots of logistics, thousands, thousands and thousands of journeys, real journeys, as wide a range of journeys as we can, looking at everyone in yeah. detail and saying, could you do this with a battery? How would you do it? How big would the battery be? Where would you have the chargers? And so on. Is there an arrangement of chargers and batteries that would do the UK's logistics? And the answer is that there is. 
Yeah. It is, and it's quite doable. <clears throat> And that's where that's where we'll go because there's, nobody's going to be able to afford the hydrogen powered version. Yeah. So yeah. it will be electric. Yeah. So I mean, then the one last thing, then, because I mean, I absolutely, you know, totally agree with you, and I can see, and I can see that infrastructure developing already. And I mean, there are trucks out, there are battery trucks out there that are in use every day today, and all the companies yep. that use them go, yeah, yeah, they work, yeah. I mean, they're not even interested in them. It's not interesting. They just do the job. <laughs> You know, which right. I think it's always a good sign when people, oh, exactly. yeah, I say, if you've got electric truck, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, that's it. There's no, nothing to yeah. talk about. But the one last thing is, uh, you know, which is we, we've looked at, well, the two last bits that are uh, sort of dreams and fantasies are certainly uh, shipping. So I've spent a day, a very frustrating day on one of the biggest container ships in the world filming on that. <laughs> And it was on its way from Bristol docks to Buenos Aires. And I had to get off. And I really wanted to go to Buenos Aires. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just That's such a, a vast... Ma- yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was such a vast machine, though. To be on a machine that big was yeah, mind-boggling. I mean, and, incredible. The, and I asked the captain, I said, how many gallons do you use to get this moving? And this wasn't... This is pre-fully charged. This was 10, 20 years ago mm. for another TV show. And he said, oh, we don't measure it in gallons, we measure it in tons. So it's 17 tons, I believe he said, of bunker fuel to get the ship moving. Once it's running, it's much more efficient, but to get it started uses vast amounts of fuel. fuel, So how on earth do we replace that fuel? Because clearly that fuel is, I don't know what the percentage of global CO2 output from shipping is, but it's it's chunky and it's it's very dirty stuff. Well, it is. It's very dirty and it's very cheap. Bunker fuel is the lowest of the low cost. Right, it's what comes out of the cracking column just before the bitumen that we use on the road. Right, it's really the yes. it's the very last horrible stuff. Uh, and it's, it's like cheap. the dregs of your tea. It's yeah. very yeah. cheap. Right, right. So, and the whole shipping industry relies on it being cheap. So, yeah, it's very difficult to see that they're suddenly going to change to some fuel which costs them ten times more, which is what hydrogen yeah. would cost them, or ammonia, which is also right. being discussed. This is yeah. difficult, Robert. I think that so total global shipping is about, again, about 2% of, um, right. of CO2 emissions. So it's, it's chunky, but it's not huge. And the question yeah. that I think is really most important is where do you start with the energy transition, right? Where do you start? Yes. And, wh- and what tail wags the dog, right? Do you yeah. start by saying, oh, aviation and shipping, they're incredibly difficult. So what are we going to do about yeah. that? Yeah, and you I. start there, nothing. or do you? <laughs> yeah, and 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 and, or do you say, well, we've got land transport and we've got heating, and these industry things. Let's just focus on that. Let's get that moving as quick yeah. as we can. Let's yeah. get eighty percent. See, eighty twenty twenty rule, right? Let's get the eighty percent done as fast as we can, and let's yeah. not get too wrapped around the angles about the most difficult the decarbonized sector, which yeah. is shipping, right? I think it's the most yeah. difficult. Now, I've got my ideas yeah. for what, what you can do for shipping. Uh, I'm not an expert on shipping, but uh, right. The, but I think that there are things you could do, and it wouldn't be hydrogen. It wouldn't be hydrogen. Right. It wouldn't be ammonia in my, in my world. In my right. world, you would take all the biofuel that we use at the moment. We use a lot of biofuel for cars, you know, you buy B10 or E10, yeah. right? It's oh, yeah. Uh, it, there's a lot of that. You take, oh, if I was the king of the world, you take all the world's biofuel and you put it shipping. Yeah. And if you do that, you can get a pretty good chunk of the shipping done. I right. think they're uh, done that way. If you look, if you yeah. use diesel for the rest, for one percent of the world's carbon emissions or something, yeah. would that so be so what? bad if you got the other yeah. 80, 80, 90, 99 percent done? Yeah. So. I, I think the answer with shipping is you don't start with it. Yes. Let's end with it. Let's yeah. make it the thing we do at the very end. There's some fantastic technologies for sailing, hybrid sailing. Yes. Uh, we just put we're just putting an episode out about uh, you know cargo ships with sails. With sails, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. So if you have hybrid sails yeah. plus biofuel, so so you use sails wherever you can. You use biofuel, yeah. you know, so it's. So there are possibilities. But look, if you never decarbonize shipping at all and yeah. you were left or you only did half of it that you could do with biofuel, you were left with, left with 1% of the world's carbon emissions. 
yeah. frankly, if we got to the point when I die where, where, where we'd reduce our emissions by 99%, I'd be pretty pleased with very, the very job happy. done yeah. and I wouldn't really care that there was 1% emissions yeah. from shipping. Well, I mean, I suppose what will happen in percentage terms, and this is where my grasp of mathematics will probably fail me, but just say that the entire ground transport system of the whole globe was powered by renewables and nuclear, and so it was electric only, and uh, all our rail transport, all our ground transport was done like that. Uh, short haul flights, maybe. I mean, I have seen some, yeah. th I yeah. think that's a, a feasible possibility. We're also short haul electric. shipping as well, right? So that, coastal, and short haul shipping, yes. Shipping. I've been on an electric ferry and that worked. Exactly. But then, uh, but then that 2% that currently would presumably increase because the because its percentage would go up, even if its actual output does go. So yeah. when shipping is sort of 60% of our carbon, out right. carbon output, that's fantastic. Exactly. <laughs> that's great, because everything else has disappeared. Yeah, exactly so. right, exactly right. That, that is right. But I think I think that, that that good, you know, perfect is the enemy of the good here. Yeah, yeah. We really don't want perfect solutions. We need good, fast solutions for the yeah. energy transition. And focusing, getting wrapped around the ankles on aviation and shipping is just not the way to get there yeah yeah no that's very i think that is an extraordinarily positive and good point to wind this up on but david i really good. want you to well a couple of things i desperately want you to come and talk at our live shows next year there's two in the uk which i would really appreciate if you would come and join us on those sure, happy shows to. and then uh, and also i want you to come back on the podcast because what you're saying is it's just really clear and logical and uh, sort of unemotional because there is an aspect of hydrogen people get very emotional about it i had someone bizarrely the other night at a 60th part, birthday party in the garden and my i was getting my ear chewed off about how i don't understand hydrogen i went well i don't i don't care i don't know why is it so important you know there is a there's certainly a an aspect of uh, the battery electric, you know, the, the the lobbying against battery electric vehicles is so effective that yeah, many people yeah. are really, you know, they just think they'll hear cobalt children, uh, yeah, lithium yeah, yeah. shortage, you know, these yeah. things. And then, I mean, I'm attending a, a, a minerals conference tomorrow with this with a with a very good company that looks at the entire global capacity from and they're going there's there isn't a lithium shortage no. there's more lithium than we can poke a stick at but Absolutely. still it will make a headline very it'll abundant. still make That's a right. headline i think yeah. the interesting thing about the lobbying around hydrogen the thing that fascinates me is that hydrogen has become the end rather than the means so yes you'd, you'd think you'd think that you know people would be that 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 the that the the big message should be that we need to we need to decarbonize we need to be more yeah. efficient we need to electrify we need to you know instead of that it's we need to make 40 gigawatts of hydrogen by 2030 so right. the the so that's fascinating how had that has that become the policy that the policy energy policy is now we need to make this amount of of you know yeah of of hydrogen Th that is a bizarre capturing of the whole agenda behind yeah. the hydrogen industry uh, yeah. instead of instead of you know we need to insulate our homes we need to be efficient we yes. need to use less energy we need to turn down the turn down the yeah. radiator no it's we have yeah. to make 40 gigawatts of of of, uh, hydrogen. of hydrogen and that is an extraordinary yeah. extraordinary as i say capturing of the agenda yeah. by the yeah. hydrogen industry so there yeah. we go no, very, but really interesting to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. And it's been uh, fascinating. And I'm sure we'll get lots of comments. Well, we I will. Think I'm, I think they'll be mostly positive. I'm probably the devil <laughs> now, I think. But anyway, that's <laughs> No, mind. you're not. You you're absolutely won't be. No, you'll have a lot of enormous support. I'll tell you that much for sure. But it's been real, really a joy talking to you, David. Thank you so Good. much. Well, thanks, great. Robert. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, I hope you can, uh, you know, uh, do tell your friends about it. I really think that it's very important that we get the message out about that because it just clarifies it. And it's so, it, it, he was so clear. I was really impressed with his, his communication skills. Really good. Great stuff. Tell your mates, tell your family. Do subscribe to the Fully Charged Plus podcast or it's going to be called something else soon. I don't even know what it's called anymore. 
<laughs> just subscribe to this podcast. There's some really good episodes coming and we're doing some exciting new things later this year and early next year. So it is worth subscribing to. We are uh, very uh, busy continuing to develop it. Um, uh, have, if you want to have a look at the Patreon link that's uh, it, it, all floating around in the show notes, please do. I'll put uh, links to the the H2 Science Coalition in the show notes as well. Uh, but that's it. As always, if you have been, thank you for listening. 